direct from New York, the Broadway tenors <coughs> revel in the glorious voices of Broadway's hottest, most sought after leading men. Come celebrate a century of Broadway's most memorable melodies with the Broadway tenors. See you at the stage door. <coughs> Hi, welcome to Love Productions live on Facebook and YouTube, Artists on Lockdown. I'm Richard Feldman. I'm the Vice President and General Manager for the Arts Center of Coastal Carolina on beautiful Hilton Head Island, South Carolina. And I'm pleased to host this issue of Artists on Lockdown featuring the Broadway tenors, including Brent Barrett, Matt Cavanaugh, and John Cudia. Hey guys, how you doing? Hey Hello. Richard, how are Good you? Day. Welcome, so glad to have you guys. Appreciate you taking this afternoon to get together. I'm so glad Love Productions could host us. and so glad to get to talk to you. Um, right if you didn't know, the Broadway tenors are some of America's musical theater's best leading men who can perform some of Broadway's greatest hits from the Great American Songbook and also great, great Broadway hits. The Arts Center has been really lucky to host these guys back in 2017 for two sold out shows. They performed the Music of the Night program, which includes songs from Andrew Lloyd Webber, including Evita, Joseph, Aspects of Love, Starlight Express, as well as some of great Broadway standards like 42nd Street, La Miz, and one of my favorites, How to Succeed in Business. Let's hear a little bit about uh, John singing for Music of the Night. Fabulous. That was gorgeous. <laughs> that was gorgeous. <laughs> and he said no, that every time. <laughs> I can see myself getting the note from Hal Prince to stop holding that so long, though. Bragger. He's going to push the <laughs> orchestra into overtime. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, so tell me, how are you guys doing in this new world order? What, so, what's going on? Are you singing? teaching, working on a new skill? What's kind of happening in your lives? Brent? Um, well, let's see. I'm doing a lot of gardening. I planted this yeah. beautiful vegetable <laughs> garden. We, um, we, had, uh, we have a big fig tree in the side yard that we planted about four years ago. And uh, so we have, last year we had three about three harvests. This year we're going to get about four. And uh, my husband, Bernie, uh, started making homemade fig newtons, which mm. Incredible, yeah. I mean, oh you take a Newton because it had, you know, that little wafer, and then there's a, but it's uh it's really delicious. Um, besides that, well, actually, we got a new roommate over the course of this period of time. Uh, my 103 year old mother moved in with us. Wow. So she was in, she was in assisted living here in Las Vegas, and when this all happened, we decided it would be safer if she just came to live with us. So. Um, so now they're, uh, we're just a little trio. <laughs> yeah, amazing. I bet it's great having your mom around and hanging out with you guys. I'm sure she's keeping you all in line. We're keeping in line. We play Skippo Day. Do you know that game, that card game? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's fun. What well, about I'm in the morning and I just gave her my, I just gave her breakfast before I came in to, uh, log on. There we sure. go. <laughs> Excellent. So, Matt, what's going on in your world and down in Jonesboro, Arkansas, right? Well, uh, we have a new roommate, too. Uh, my wife and I just had our third child. Uh, six months old. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, we, we have two boys, two rambunctious boys, and we just assumed we've had, had another boy because that's what we do. We have boys. And out popped the little girl. But uh, so we have Rose, Eileen, Kavanaugh, and thrilled to have her. Um, she will be six months in just a few days. She was born on January 11th, thankfully before this whole thing, you know, started. Um, yeah. But she has, it has been a lot, a lot of fun to have a little girl around the house. So that is, uh, uh, that and the two rugrats that we're chasing around, that is, keep, keeps us busy. 
well, you're now going to be in trouble having a little girl, and she's going to the room. You know that. Those boys she already oh. is uh, uh, asserting herself that, that she's different from the boys in certain <laughs> ways. Oh, of course she is. She's in charge. That's she right. will be the one who's in charge, so That's watch right. out. I know having a, a younger daughter who's 19, it's definitely a new world. It's a lot of fun. Yes, it is. Everyone's got to start putting the seat down now. I, I do have to remind George, the oldest of that. I'm like, George, come on. Let's talk about this. There's a routine. Come on. Yep. Get it down. Get it down. So, John, what's going on in your world? You're up in Jersey? and Yeah, up in Jersey. And uh, we've pretty much gotten used to transitioning everything to online now. Uh, my girls finished their – I have two daughters. Uh, mm -hmm. Two and a dog are the only boys in the house. Um, but they finished their school online, and now they're doing their summer camp online too which is a musical theater camp so that's a new world for them um my wife teaches voice uh, online too so she's keeping busy doing that and mm -hmm. uh, i've been trying to do whatever i can do to keep busy um that's as much singing as i can do um, yeah so yeah but we're uh, we're doing well good that's amazing yeah, I'm trying to stay sane too. Gardening is the biggest thing and keeping the family going, that's about as much fun. But boy, the gardens never look better. I wish I could grow <laughs> food, but boy, it's a task. So uh, why don't you guys tell me, what got you, what are you guys looking forward to going back on stage and doing what we do best? Tell me, how did you guys get hooked into doing this? What started out your thing that said, okay, this is it, this is the thing? I mean. Please tell me it was something inspiring like a course sign or whatever it was. It really said, okay, this is my calling. What started you guys out? Was your first? Frank, go ahead. Yeah. Well, uh, I did a production of Calamity Jane when I was in high school. And uh -huh. that was I, that was the moment that I just that I decided that's what I wanted to do. Um, because up to that point I sang, I you know, played around in the art room, I painted and I did this, but th when I did that, it was kind of like the lights went off and I said, oh, I had no idea that I could actually make a career out of doing that until I went to college. Um, but that's, that was the, uh, that was the moment that, uh, that, uh, everything became clear. That's very cool. Matt, what about your world? As uh, similar, um, I saw my, it was the year before, I was about to go into high school that fall, and in the spring prior, I saw the high school production of West Side Story. Mm -hmm. I was blown away by the show and uh, by the performances, and I thought, wow, I want to get involved in this. So I got very much involved in my high school program, like a lot of kids do, and then went on to college in New York, and nice little full circle moment that, you know, years later, um, I was able to do West Side Story on Broadway. I was probably more age appropriate when I saw it in high school. Yeah, I think so. I know. Like, bro, we won't discuss that too much. But no. uh, <laughs> and, that was uh, that was where I, I guess I got hooked. <laughs> I'll do it. John was your world. Yeah, I I started singing as a kid, really young, as really as as long as I can remember. I was always singing, and I also got involved in. The band. I played the drums and uh, did whatever was going on at school that had to do with music um, or performing. I pretty much got into, but it wasn't until I heard and then saw Les Mis for the first time that it was like, oh my God, that uh, it was really Les Mis for me. And then I just said, that's that's what I'm going for. So that was probably, I think I heard it for the first time when I was somewhere between 15 and 16 and, and then made up my mind that that's what I wanted to do. That is impressive in all parts. I mean, it's great that this inspiration comes in. I think a Chicago, the original Chicago did a tryout in Baltimore and I was a kid and we all went to the mechanic, the old mechanic theater and got to see Chicago. And hey, Pete, could you roll that Chicago from Brent? That'd be really cool to see that. And that was like the kicker of what a show that everybody got inspired and it was the original production. Chicago was the first show I saw on Broadway, the original production. Oh. 
Really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That production was dynamic. And I was blown away as you know, just gone, this is something else. And it's like, okay, Fossey, you really killed me on that one. I was just a kid, but it just riveted me to musical theater. Yeah. So that was the first show you did. And what was it like doing that show again? And then, well, of course, when I saw it when I was 18, I was looking and going, well, there's really nothing I can play in this, but maybe Mary Sunshine, you know. <laughs> yeah. So then, and then so you jump ahead 20 years and I'll, okay, well, okay. You, you grow up and you grow into roles. Um, and you grow into roles. Was, I, you know, it's, I, I, I've done it on and off for 22 years. And uh, it's just one of those shows. It's just, it's, it's pure joy to do. You know? Absolutely. Um, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Just amazing. So tell me, what's the biggest reward of being a Broadway tenor? I mean, it's such an exciting group and having seen you guys twice and watch the energy and the dynamics. I know it's multiple people that come in and out. Brent, you've been with them. You guys have all been with them. But uh, John, tell me what's like the, the biggest reward of being a tenor and what's the kind of impact it's been on your career? Uh, well, for me, it's really two things. Uh, the first thing is, is I love the camaraderie with the guys. Uh, yeah. It's, I mean, uh, I, I almost hesitate to call it work. Um, I really look forward to getting together and getting out on stage with these guys. It, so many of the arrangements have us all together on stage at the same time that we really get really just to play. Um, and that's really what I look forward to. Um, the other thing I think is just the sheer variety of material we get to sing. It's shows that we've done for sure, but maybe it's shows we've never done or music we don't normally get to sing. Um, and so we get to add a little bit of variety and something new and interesting to us. Mm-hmm. It's mainly those two things, you know, it's just a, it's a great outlet to continue to remind me what about performing I love the most, which is really just having fun and uh, being out there. Absolutely. Matt, how's it for you guys? Well, it's two things for me, too. It's, it's Brent Barrett and John Cunilla. I mean, those are my favorite. Was I good? I mean, just set it right up there and knocked it out. <laughs> it, it, you know, uh, not to sound too mushy, but it is fun. You know, we're just guys. We come, we hang out, we have a lot of fun. And the material is so great. Uh, the material was great in the original shows that there was in. And uh, the material it stands up. You know, I would I hesitate to say better, but boy, it is a lot of fun. The, the arrangements are terrific. To be able to sing in front of, uh, whether it's a three-piece ensemble or a full orchestra, um, is just a, a real thrill. And um, I mean, I, I don't know how you could go wrong getting to sing, you know, Rodgers and Hammerstein and Cole Porter and Sondheim and Lloyd Webber and just all these, this great music. It's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, your musical director does a bang up job with the orchestrations. So Uncle we Phil, were Mr. Phil Reno. Yes, we love Phil Reno. Top notch. The arrangements are great. We had a three piece and it sounded brilliant. And these guys were pickup uh, musicians from our town. Killer show. Just a killer show. They loved it. And they loved that the tracks were clean. Everybody had a wonderful time. It was a lot of fun. It was definitely a fun show. And Brent, you've kind of been with this. This is your baby. Broadway yeah. tenor, your baby, get this going. You and Matt kind of- um, I started this back in 2000, uh, in 2000 with, uh, with my friend Betsy Friday. And uh, the whole idea was to, you know, just Exa- what what the guys have said it's you know it's it's all about getting together the camaraderie and the joy of making music together that you don't normally have because we're we don't really we don't get to work with each other um you know, doing mm-hmm. shows and so this was it was a way to come you know to give everybody an opportunity to do something and do something they don't normally do and uh and also to kind of fill in the gaps between the times when you're doing uh, when you're doing shows so, I get it. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you get three leading men and you're not going to be in the same role, same show ever in that time. I mean, it might happen, but the rarities of that are you know, way beyond compare. But doing the show with the three of you guys together like this, it's just a blast. Absolutely. Yeah. It is. So let's talk a little bit about career things. Um, what shows gave you a boost in your career that you didn't expect? Something that all of a sudden you were thrown into or you had to, or you just didn't jump in and said, oh, this this took me to another place. So Matt, what about your world? You've had so many ups and all different things going on. And 
what show really said, okay, this is this is what pushes me forward? Well, uh, now hearing you ask the question, I, I did a small little uh, non-equity tour of Gershwin Strike Up the Band. And it was a concert version of the tour. We played different cities, but uh, I forget. We were somewhere down around the D.C. area. And uh, Jeff Blumenkrantz uh, saw me. Uh, Jeff Blumenkrantz, longtime you know, Broadway actor and a writer and television. And, um, and he mentioned to somebody, he mentioned to somebody, he mentioned to somebody. And lo and behold, they bring me in to play the lead role or the audition for the lead role of uh, Urban Cowboy. Now, the musical Urban Cowboy was a huge flop, but that got that was my break, you know, into New York and Broadway. And that's what started it. And you never know what's going to, you know, what, what stones lead to that, that, that big break. So I was doing this small little concert version of Strike Up the Band um, that someone saw me in and said to a friend and a friend and a friend. And then, you know, I was uh, starring, you know, help nine months later, you know, uh, yeah. on Broadway. And that kind of led to, you know, uh, the beginning of my career. The constant connections always surprise me. It is uh, yeah. you know, six weeks of separation and those pickups may make a big difference. What about you, Brent? Something that really said, okay, this is pushed um, me forward. Well, you know, as with Matt, my, my first Broadway show was West Side Story. Um, uh -huh. And that brought me, took me from college right to New York. Um, but then, you know, you, I've, I've all, I, I worked consistently, but then I did a little, a little cabaret show down in the village called Next time now at uh, 88s, which was uh -huh. and, uh, which then was expanded into a two act show called Closer Than Ever, and we played oh. the Cherry Lane Theater for six months. Oh and wow! Even that little show got so much attention, and um, and then from that I went into Grand Hotel. So I I, I think I think Closer Than Ever, this, you know, this little one hour cabaret that it exploded with, uh, and. Uh, I, I would say that's probably what put me on the road then to doing Grand Hotel and becoming a legitimate leading man as opposed to a juvenile. Right. It's a <laughs> next step in there. Yeah. John, what about your world? Yeah, it's it, it's kind of yeah. difficult to pick one particular role or particular show because they all, sometimes things really kind of go one to the other into the other and you never know how things are going to like a pinball machine and rebound off of this connection or that connection. I mean, uh, obviously for me, Les Mis was the foundation of everything. Mm -hmm. uh, it was my Broadway debut. Um, and uh, that was a, an incredibly fortunate and wonderful start. Then Phantom came into my life in the late 90s and that led to the next 11 years of my career, whether it was being in Phantom or whether it was doing concert material that was based on Phantom or connections that came out of being on tour. I mean, it, it, Phantom opened a tremendous number of doors for me. Um, the, uh, the show that was the most sort of surprising thing that, that happened was a production of Evita at Vancouver Opera. And oh. I had always had a passion uh, for singing opera and studying opera, but the primary income in my career was from musical theater. And that was the first time that uh, I did um, the role of Peron in an opera theater that led me to audition for the opera company that led me to an actual opera role in a grand opera. So it was an enormous, shift and it was exactly what I wanted and needed at the time. So probably in the most recent history was that had the most impact of, of uh, taking a particular job in a particular place to end up. Yeah. That's definitely a leap from uh, going from the musical theater world to the opera world. And Vita is a good, is a really great entry point. A lot of Parones came from the opera world that I've worked at, worked with and transition back and forth all the time. Yeah. All right, so here's something I want to ask you guys. I want to hear some of your favorite lines of your shows and act them out. So. <laughs> all right, I'll come go on. first so I can get it over with. I'll go first. Okay. So uh, mine is, uh, is, of course, from Les Mis, um, because I wouldn't be here without Les Mis. 
And this was always one of the most bittersweet moment, moments of the show, both as an audience member and actually playing the role because it comes all the way at the end. And it's the moment when um, uh, Valjean is about to pass away and his daughter Cosette comes in and he's decided now to tell her the story of her life. And so as an audience member, you've been on this three hour plus journey. You've watched all these things happen. You know that she doesn't know. So now mm -hmm. you know she's going to find out everything. And also as the character, it's the time where you are giving her the greatest gift that you can give her, which is her history. So Valjean. Oh, we just lost your mic. Oh no! Wait a minute. We have no. Oh, Can't hear you. Can't hear you. <laughs> the most important part of the story. You're mute. Press the button. Press the press the press the mic button or something. Am I still hitting my back now? There you go. Oh, my gosh, now we can hear you. Hear you. Can you, you have hear to go me? back now. We lost the most important part of the story. Go that's to somebody what, else and figure it out. Goes. No, you're good now. You're you're live. You're good. We got you. So go back to when you said Jean Valjean was about to tell Cosette. <laughs> what happened? Take your hand away. <laughs> it sounds like your mother. Okay. This is what Mark Kudish does whenever he goes up on a line. He pretends that the mic isn't working. So I think that's what right. John. Goes up on the line. I like that. That works perfectly. Remember. Oh, the mic. It's not the. Can you hear us back there, John? <laughs> Testing, testing. Testing. Are you on, John? Sing for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll wait for John to come back. So, Matt, while you're thinking about this amazing story about Le Mis that we missed on, so tell us what <laughs> your favorite line of a show and act it out. My favorite line? Okay. Uh, gosh. That, 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 that's a tough one. I, I don't know what... Um, one of my favorite roles to play was Jerry in uh, Great Gardens. So uh, uh -huh. if you saw the musical Great Gardens, which of course starred the incredible Christine Eversall and Mary Lewis Wilson. Um, I played Literally. Joe Kennedy in the first act, uh, but in the second act I got to play Jerry. And um, uh, Jerry, by the way, is uh, still around and lives out on Long Island. Very nice guy, got to meet him. Um, Jerry didn't talk, but we just kind of, at least as a kid, the way Alan Maisel, the Maisel brothers, captured him in that documentary he just kind of grunted a lot you know just kind of a lot of grunts and mm, corn uh, and things of that you know, that that could have been uh that could have been my, my favorite so I'll, I'll sit here and uh, i'll eat my apple which will be my corn and uh, that'll be my yes <laughs> little eating and that was it there we go <laughs> That's it. Ta-da. Ta-da. Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. So what's going on, Brent, on your world? It's got to be something out of the years. You want what in the years? Uh, out of the years of... Oh, the years of, of all right, I'll do it. I'll, I'll, I'll do this one line. And you tell me where it's from. Oh, okay. Okay. I'll right. quit. Uh-huh. Okay. I'll just go like Figure this. it out. You try my patience. How's that? <laughs> um, what do you think that um, one? <laughs> um, the one I, uh, are you a pirate? My guy. <clears throat> Phantom. Phantom. There. We, we... Well, I think we lost John for a second, but we'll get him back. I know they're working on him right now. Fabulous. Like Jersey <laughs> lockdown. He doesn't have any internet connection either. He's just locked oh, yeah, in. Exactly. Must be Jersey. <laughs> so here's that question. Are you back with us, John? Great. I can hear oh, you now. Can you hear this me now? Yes. We can hear you. Yay. All right. Good. All right. So we have to get back to the story about Lamitz. You were at the okay. point where Jean was about to tell Cosette, and then we lost you. So okay. we'll rewind this a little bit, and let's get us back, because this was an engrossing story. All right, where where did I leave off? I'm about to tell her. Don't be dying. I think you're on your deathbed. Yeah, it was dying. There was bodies all over the stage. I give her a piece of paper and I say, 
On this page I write my last confession. Read it well when I at last am sleeping. It's a story of those who always loved you. Your mother gave her life for you, then gave you to my keeping. It's always been my favorite line because I love how he tells her it's a story. But you've just sat through the whole story and now she gets to read the story of her life. So one wow. of my mm. touching. It's mm -hmm. such a breakdown of the show. It only took Absolutely. half an hour to hear that. <laughs> it, did. it was it well did. worth yeah. the wait. <laughs> oh, well worth the wait. Absolutely. So what roles would you guys like to ever do again? Or if you're sitting in a play, do, working on your show, and you're going, God, I need to do that show. I need to do that role. Is there any roles that just you're dying to redo or dying that you've never gotten a chance to do? You say, this is my time. Like, Brent, you were saying, hey, I was a kid when I saw Chicago. Now I aged into Chicago. Are there roles that just, like, you're dying to do, Brent, and go, this is my time? I did a, did a production of Camelot, which I loved. And I would, any any time I get a chance to do King Arthur again, I would grab it. Um, yeah. You know, but um, I'd love to do uh, Don Quixote and La Mancha at some point. Don Quixote was amazing. Old and I can't walk across the stage. Oh. <laughs> Everybody says it's an old man's show, but no, I, it's definitely, you gotta have some stamina in that show. It's yeah. never. It really is. Uh, I got to do it once with uh, John Cullum and as Don Q, and uh, that was such an exciting venture. And he was a brilliantly heartfelt Don Q, and so, just what a gentleman on stage and off, and very giving, very giving actor. So yeah, it's a great role, absolutely great role. John, what kind of role? What shows that you were dying to do or get back in and do it again uh, when we can go back? I got a chance to play Tony in college. And I was nowhere near ready for how difficult it was. Mm -hmm. And I often think about getting another shot at, at singing that role and singing that music. It would have to be an enormous opera house where people were 12, <laughs> at least 12 miles away. <laughs> The 30 feet rule has to really come into play, doesn't it? You know, yeah. concert, but you know, I just, I adored it so much. Uh, and uh, I, I think about singing that score again, for sure. Oh, absolutely. Definitely the list. Matt, what's kind of rocking your world? That's, that's been thinking, um, okay, I can think of something that's right, age appropriate or not. <laughs> maybe, maybe they could just put, get, put, set, uh, you know, pass out glasses and put Vaseline on the lenses. So you know, classes and masks. That'll yeah. be perfect. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I did a, a short summer stock production of uh, at Pittsburgh CLO of uh, Carousel, uh, and I'd love to, I'd love to do that again. Uh, do Billy Bigelow, Billy Bigelow again uh, in a uh, production this night. You know, microwave theater, like you know some of those summer stocks are, right? Mm -hmm. right. rehearsal then they shoot you out so something that's not microwave theater you know that'd be that I, I, I love that score i love the story so that'd be a, a, a great one to do all right well now i got a list of shows that i need to produce and get you guys back and we'll do it <laughs> right. do it do a whole season of broadway tenors each individual at the time and you guys will try to cross over so you can get to see each other but no guarantees sure. we'll figure that out <laughs> So I, 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 was, I can't think of anything better than spending time on Hilton Head, right? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, right now, it's it's the best time, best place to be. We have great place to stay, and the shows are always amazing. Uh, one of the biggest regrets right now, we're not able to produce, and we're supposed to do Footloose this summer. It's going to be so exciting. A young company, I mean, kids just out of school who are just dynamic. So we're kind of heartbroken that we haven't been able to produce that. But... We are looking forward to our next season that's going to be coming hopefully up in the fall. I'm keeping our fingers crossed, if not, not earlier, maybe later. So flubs, speaking of flubs, we had that, John. What has been our biggest flubs on stage? God knows we've had so many, and they do not do not have the name names, shows, or whatever. You can just, because we don't want, uh, we want uh, the innocent to be kept innocent. So, Matt, has there been something on stage that's just gone, oh, this was flubby. This um, is a mess. 
We were uh, out of town trying out West Side Story at the National Theater in D.C. And Tony makes his first entrance, at least in our production. I, I wrote a, uh, the set piece, uh, Doc's store moved in and Tony, I was standing on a ladder and it wrote in. And that's how Tony was introduced, you know, with a scene with Riff before he's seeing something's coming. And for some reason, the, 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 the set piece, the track got messed up and it pulled. And uh, I'm on top of this ladder. I'm probably, I don't know, seven, eight feet above the ground. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, you know, me, I'm not quite six feet tall. So I was pretty high up there. Uh, and it catches and it shoots me off like a slingshot. And I fall off and, you know, uh, the sound guy, he's following his cue. He's bringing up my mic just as this is happening and the lights are coming up. So the first words from the young ingenue are some very choice words that I won't repeat here. Uh, but, uh, uh, the curtain came down. They ended up having to take me to the hospital just to kind of check me out. I, I was I was fine. I missed that night's performance, but then I came back the next day. But uh, that was some choice words from Tony from the street, you know. But uh, I will oh say, my uh, God. yeah, I mean, John, is, uh, you brought up, um, you know, at the time when you, you played Tony, you kind of a uh, weren't, weren't quite prepared for the role and the, and the song. The, 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 and I remember lying there on that stage because Arthur Lawrence was very adamant about in Maria singing you know, the, the B flat rather than the optional going and uh, which, you know, we did, but uh, uh, there was some fear in early on in rehearsal and early on in previews, just some fear and hesitancy, you know, from me to, to do that, just confidence, you know, issue. And I remember lying there on that ground as I just been thrown off the set piece and said those choice words to the audience. But I remember what went through my head was, you know, Matt, what the hell are you afraid of this song for? Just, get up there and do it, you know? So that was kind of what was going through my head at that time. So it ended up, I guess, being a, a fortuitous moment uh, for me, but that was a, a boo-boo, I guess. Yeah. It's a definitely, definitely a boo-boo. Brett, <laughs> Brett, what happened on your world? Anything that just kind of a mind, or not? Me, a mind is a terrible thing to lose. And um, most <laughs> It's it's always I'll, I'll be on stage and you know in, in the script you're do, you're in the middle of the show then all of a sudden you turn the page and it's blank, I you know going up it's like, <clears throat> and it usually happens like after six months into a run, because yeah. you're like you know you're good good and then you like kind of relax and you do it and it's like so uh, it, it happened in London when I was doing Grand Hotel and we were on the stage and we were doing I was doing the bedroom scene with Lillian Montevecchi and and we were at opposite sides of the stage and all of a sudden I just like blank and she can see my face that I have no <laughs> idea what I'm supposed to say and so so she kind of turns out to the audience and says well usually you say this and now you say now that did nothing <laughs> where are we and it's where like, are we where are we and it was like I, you know it gave me time to take a breath and to kind of get back into the scene but it, you know it's it's always me going up that's what it is it's a safety net. Me because I would go up in the in the courtroom scene in Chicago, and she sure. said, "It always looks like it's my fault." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's understanding that we do this because it takes a village. The everybody on stage is working together, and when yeah. that stuff happens, you have to be able to go. There's a friend out there for me, and they're going to help me get through this, no matter what. Yeah. God bless everybody on stage and off stage. Everybody. everybody. John, there's got to be something. Yeah. You know, I'm well, sorry. As you just described, that was exactly the situation I, I found myself in. Uh, one music of the night on the national tour. Mm -hmm. We were on our journey into the Phantom's Lair on the boat. We were getting on onto the boat off stage, and the stage manager said to me, something's going on with the set. Uh-oh. Um, we're working on it. But beware that stuff's probably going to be happening while you're out there. And so when we got into the lair, the Christine and I, the only thing that arrived was us. So no, no candelabras, no organ, no mirror, no. absolutely nothing. And just as you say, we really locked into each other because we knew that the stage management and the crew were working on repairing whatever was wrong. Um, sure. Christine and I just locked into each other's eyes and, and really kind of improv the scene um, around where we knew it was safe to walk. Um, so 
it was one of those things where I think even at the time I had felt like I had been in the show long enough to where I had experienced just about everything that could go wrong. Um, well, something did bigger. Yeah. And uh, yeah. this was really a fun one because uh, we, we worked together so closely on getting through the scene together and eventually everything found its way on stage, you know, by the end of the song, so. Wow, what, it's a challenge. It's constantly amazes me that we can all survive this sometimes when stuff goes down. So let's talk about our quarantine. We're in a weird world doing strange things. Let's quick round robin. What is the strangest thing you guys have bought online? A, a rainbow set of badminton birdies. There you go, hey, Brent. Um, it was um, support handles for the toilet for my mother when she moved in here. Oh, <laughs> so that was a, probably. Yes, that was the oddest thing. Yeah, safety rails that I could attach to the toilet for. I'm sure your pop-ups are amazing right now. You're probably getting some very interesting pop-ups right now. Oh, Matt, yeah. Kind of, yeah. With all the with the new kids coming in and everything else. Uh huh. Yeah, I, I just always get the notifications on my Amex. Somebody just bought something on Amazon. Somebody just bought something on Amazon. So <laughs> I don't know. Let me ask my wife because uh, she, she's clicking that button. Jeff Bezos made it really easy. <laughs> yeah, you don't even have to put your card in. You just press and say, no. yeah, buy it. Yeah. It's all free. Absolutely. It just comes up. It's all free. Right. That's right. Uh, <laughs> it's crazy to say. So. Obviously, we're cooking at home. Best meals cooking at home. What best meals come up since we're not going out? All right, the Costco ribeye steaks in a cast iron pan. Jealous. Oh, so good. Matt, it's got to be something well, good. Again, I, I take no credit. I'm very good at doing dishes. I, I'm the dishes man. Oh. But, but Jenny is very good at the cooking, and she's really learned how to perfect the broiler in the oven, not just baking fish, but broiling it. And I gotta say, last night the salmon was incredible. I mean, just uh, a nice glaze on top. Uh, you know, it's a nice, nice uh, crisp. Uh, and it was just absolutely perfect. So, uh, just getting better and better. Getting hungry now. Hunting for dinner. Yeah, via Brent. Besides the Fig Newtons, which I'm totally blown away by. But also, you know, we we also got a KitchenAid mixer. So for whatever reason, Bernie's decided to become. Bernie the baker. So he's baking a cake every week. Um, he had made a coconut cake, then um, a devil's food cake for my mother's birthday, then a strawberry cake. He's just baking, 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 which of course, you know, during a quarantine and you're sitting at home, it's not necessarily the best thing to be doing, but we're enjoying it. <laughs> um, but Are I you putting on your COVID-19? Are you putting on your COVID-19? Yeah. Well, as you see, I'm going to show you. We found a bike, a reclining bike online. Hey, yeah. So at least, yeah. at least that's a good online purchase. At, at that was that was a good that was a good purchase. Um, all the 24 hour fitnesses went out of business, and so we we uh, managed to uh, put a little gym together here. I guess I probably my chicken piccata. It's pretty good. Oh yeah. Oh, I bet it's absolutely amazing. Yeah. So uh, as we're getting the. You know, the world's changing right now. We have a lot of impact on American theater. And, you know, as artists, the impact's changing how we do things and how we're influencing people, how we're continuing to promote equality. And our audience needs to feel, what's, what are your thoughts about that? What are your thoughts about how we need to get out as artists, how we need to change things, not just about COVID-19, about equality in the workplace, equality in producing. It's influencing all of us. The discussions are already starting. What are your thoughts about that as artists in this world isolated right now, but how it's going to impact us in the future. Well, I, I think it's our job is to create uh, and it's it's certainly a tough time to feel uh, creative. Um, mm -hmm. But I think moving forward, you know, what we do is serve the audience. And I think it's just being mindful of creating spaces that can give an audience a place to feel inspired and hopefully be inspired to continually become better people. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's what I think is, uh, is most important going uh, forward right now is that we continue to take inventory of ourselves and ask ourselves, how can we keep improving on the inside? 
and make a difference in our own lives, in our families' lives, and then in the community as a whole. And I think as artists, our part of our job in creating is creating a space where people can go to feel safe and allow themselves to feel uh, inspired to, to improve and be better people. I think you nailed it. That's great, John. Thank you for saying that out there. Um, but let me just point out. And also, you know, in, in theater, as in television and in film, you know, we, the uh, audiences want to see themselves reflected in yeah. what, what they're watching and what they're viewing. And I, as an older white man, have been so lucky because there were no restrictions as to what I could do. And that is fortunately changing in the theater in all of aspects of entertainment. And, um, and I think it's very important, you know, that, that audiences see themselves up on stage and that it becomes more inclusive as far as um, who is being represented. And mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, it's, you know, uh, as, as, as John was saying, you know, we want to, you know, it's about creating and about putting things out there, but it's also about giving everyone a platform to express themselves and their, and get their voices out. Absolutely. You know, we're coming back to the end and we want to come back to theater and stages. So what kind of new sense of passion to our work that we're going to bring after this long intermission? I mean, this is the longest that I haven't produced a show in my career. This is the longest that we've done something different. And I know I'm not going to take any of the work that we do for granted. Not that I ever do, but this is really a big thing. What are we going to bring back after this time of heart? from our colleagues and from our work and from our audiences and from our craft that we've been doing for all our lives, what do you think we're gonna bring back after this time apart? And what's gonna be the, the biggest thing that we're gonna take uh, from our homes and from our, our own self-evaluation out to the audience? What's going to, what do you think is gonna be the biggest impact at this point? <clears throat> I think the uh... You know, this has forced everybody to kind of reevaluate their lives, reevaluate everything and and go, well, you know, and, and, and it's like, well, what 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 do I really need? What do I need to survive? What is it that, you know, we, we keep getting more and more things and it's like, well, do I really need all of this stuff? I mean, what is what is what is the least amount that we can have and still survive? Um, and I think it's forced artists, you know, to go online and to do streaming and to do and to get out there to try and reach people, you know, that since we can't get together, but we're, we are all, I think we as humans really, we, we need that interaction. You know, we all want to be in the same room at the same time. And oh, absolutely. How do we, how do we do that? And I'm sure you're, you're experiencing that with the theater, just trying to figure out how we can best do that um, and keep everybody safe at the same time. Exactly. I miss the process of working with actors on a daily basis mm -hmm. in watching them grow as artists and create a story yeah. and tell that story to the audience and watch the audience's reaction and alive. But we are thinking differently. We're thinking the next step mm -hmm. and not just plan A, B, and C, but also plan D, E, and F, and what's going to change, because we're out of control. But we do have uh, a responsibility to keep our voice going, because the impact that you guys have as artists, I know you come in, you do a show, you go away with the tenors, but you invest in longer periods on, when you're on the tours and Broadway, you see the impact time and time again, when people stop you in the street, they talk to you about your performance and you go, this is impactful, this is something different. Now we're bringing something quite a bit more out of this. Matt, do you have any thoughts at all? Yeah, in a similar situation, uh, my wife, Jenny Powers and I, we started a, uh, a theater uh, in Arkansas where, where we live in Jonesboro, uh, at the link theater.org if anybody's interested. But we were able to do our first production of the Fantastics, went you know, really well, we were happy about it, the first of March and then the whole world changed. 
Uh, right. And so like yourself, Richard, we've been figuring out how do we serve our community? Uh, and it was really Jenny's idea. A few weeks ago, we had an outdoor concert. There's an outdoor space, outdoor amphitheater. Uh, and we invited just a very limited uh, uh, number of people to attend uh, outside, sitting on the grass, away and separate from each other. But we uh, did a live stream so people could watch online like we're doing now. Uh, it was just solos. The only duet was me and Jenny. And, well, we're, we're our own pod, so we were safe. Uh, distance between the musicians, uh, just a piano and drums. Um, but really to serve our community, because everyone's been suffering through the coronavirus uh, pandemic, uh, everyone in different ways has uh, felt the uh, tragedy of uh, George Floyd's uh, death, among others, and how that has impacted race relations and um uh, marches for equality and justice, but also in our hometown, we had a tornado uh, come through right at the, uh, the end of March as well. So yeah. we're, what can we do to speak to our community, to just um, uplift our community, to serve our community? And so we did that and it went really well. And you could tell that the audience that was there uh, really appreciated it. They needed it. As you've said, they, they want interaction. They wanted to find a way to come together in a safe way. And so every generation has their challenges that they overcome and the theater always speaks to that. And like John said, that, that that's our role to figure out, you know, how to find truth uh, in the challenges that uh, is present in our lives. And the added challenge is how we produce that in a safe uh, way for our audiences to uh, take in and hopefully uh, share with each other and make the world a better place. So I know that's what we're looking to do. And, uh, it's, a, it's a challenging time right now. I do think some of the technological advances that we're all we've all adapted very quickly are probably going to stick around in, in different ways. I think you probably oh, yeah. see more multimedia facets to live theater that uh, we didn't quite incorporate before, and you know, that's probably a good thing. I believe it's true. Well, guys, listen, we're uh, about our time. I want to thank you guys for taking the time to talk. It's been great seeing you all and getting to pick your brains and have some fun. I really appreciate uh, Love Productions for putting this all together. And of course, Matt uh, producing the show. And and of course, Pete behind the scenes. I wanna thank you guys all for your time. And I wish you well, staying healthy, staying happy, wish your families are fun. And thank you so much. I'm gonna take it out with Matt, seeing a little bit from the show. So Pete, let's take it away and take care guys. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you, Richard. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Broadway tenors, revel in the glorious voices of Broadway's hottest, most sought after leading men. Come celebrate a century of Broadway's most memorable melodies with the Broadway tenors. See you at the stage door.